yeah, everything looks incredible. So yeah, I think you are. So you I are think ready. start. Uh, so again, hi everyone. Uh, for those who just joined. Uh, my name is Marcin, and today I'm going to talk about uh, building GraphQL in Python and Django. So my talk is called Real World Graphene, Lessons Learned from Building GraphQL API on Top of Django App. Um, yeah, so uh, to quickly introduce myself, my name is Marcin, as I said. Um, yeah, I come from Wrocław uh, in Poland. Um, I work as a Python developer here at a company called Mirumi Software. Uh, we are a software house um, specializing in e-commerce, but we also do uh, other web apps with uh, GraphQL and React. Uh, we use Python as a backend mostly. Um, and for the last two years, I had the pleasure to be a lead developer at a project called Sailor, which is like one of our most important projects right now. Um, yeah, so what's also important here uh, in Wrocław, we are doing a GraphQL Wrocław as well. Uh, I, I didn't mention that before, but this is also something that you might be interested in, uh, Every anyone uh, listening to this, to this event. So yeah, we have our own meetup here as well. Uh, we have quite many members there. Like on every meetup, we have like 100 and 150 people. So it's, it's really big community of uh, developers here in Wrocław in Poland. So uh, if there is anybody el else like interested in uh, joining us and speaking at our event, it would be great. Just contact me. Uh, yeah. So. I want to introduce you to Sailor because um, this is pretty important in the context of, of my presentation because like this this project is where we start the journey of GraphQL. Um, so Sailor is um, basically an e-commerce platform. Uh, it's open source, uh, so you can find it on GitHub. Um, and well, I, I'm. It's you know it depends how much familiar you are with e-commerce, but I'm sure that many people heard about. Shopify or Magento, WooCommerce, stuff like this. So Sailor is something similar. You can think about uh, Sailor as um, Shopify, but open source, or for, or for example, Magento, but uh, built with a little bit different technology because like we use Python, um, which is at the very core of our uh, platform. Uh, we, we believe that this makes our product um, like uh, better in terms of uh, code quality for example because this is open source product product so it's it's really important to have uh, good code quality there uh, so this this entire platform consists of few parts uh, so this is a screenshot of the dashboard application uh, so this is where you manage your shop basically this is a front-end um, app built in react uh, it's using graphql underneath um, here we have the storefront application so this is a kind of template of a shop that you can take from GitHub as well and build your shop uh, using using this temp template. Um, and a few facts about our API, because all of that is powered by GraphQL API. So we have now about 50 queries, 200 mutations, and 500 types. So this is like a few statistics to give you an overview about the size of the API currently. Uh, we have um, JSON Web Tokens um, based authentication and permissions system. Uh, from like the more cool features, we have service accounts and webhooks. So this means that you can not only use that API for your front-end apps, but you can also uh, build integrations uh, like other services that can authenticate in our API and fetch some data uh, or get some notification by, web by webhooks. So this is really cool. And um, what we really li like about our uh, API is also that we have pretty unified way of filtering, sorting, and search in all uh, top-level queries. So these are a few facts. Um, actually, I have uh, like the running app on my machine, so I, I think it can, it can be interesting to see how it looks like. So this is the dashboard application. Um, this is where you manage your shop. Uh, here's, for example, the list of your products. Uh, you can go to product details and do some kind of uh, management here. We have orders management, customers management, and all kinds of uh, features that you might need in uh, e-commerce. Uh, what might be interesting for you is that, as I said, it's all running uh, on GraphQL. 
So if I reload this, um, then you can see that there are some GraphQL requests underneath. Um, like for example here, uh, yes, that's that's data from our uh, e-commerce API. Um, so in this case, we are getting, for example, customers' data. Uh, yeah, so this is pretty exciting. This is like a huge, huge React app that works really well here with GraphQL. Uh, here is our storefront application. So as I said before, this is just a template of, of the shop that you can customize. And it's also a single page app. It's using GraphQL underneath. And um, here we have also the playground. So if you don't need any front end, you can just use this API, for example, to get data of your products. So for example, here is a query to get a uh, product from my shop. Uh, so for example, I have uh, apple juice and here I have a bunch of variants of that product. So yeah, so this API gives you access to all kinds of e-commerce operations that you might need. Uh, so you can use it standalone or you can integrate that with your existing uh, solutions. So if you are interested, um, we have, uh, so this is all open source, as I said. Um, so go to github.com slash mirumi slash sailor if you are interested in, in using this. Uh, we also have public demos. So if you want to just try out uh, without installing it locally, then use that demo to play with, with the platform. So um, I'm talking about this up entire application because that's where our journey with GraphQL has started. So this entire app was initially built as a Django, like purely Django project. So for those who are not familiar with Django, this is like classic um, framework where like you have model, model view controller pattern. So it's all a huge monolith where like both front end and back end lives in the same code base. Uh, so that was fine for us for, for a few years at the beginning. But at some point you start to realize that if you want to introduce some, inter in, uh, sorry, extensions like integrations with other services, then you might need API. And we had no API before uh, adding GraphQL. And also you will notice that maybe those static templates that you have in Django are not enough to build a first class user interface with you know dynamic features. Uh, and like modern apps have really complex UI and this is not achievable with static HTML templates. So after having this Django based architecture for many years, we decided to add GraphQL layer on top. So this is what we've actually ended up with. Uh, so on top of our um, Django, uh, ORM uh, logic and all the Python logic that does the business stuff. We've added GraphQL layers, so it's built with Graphene. And we've moved all of our, like two of our front end apps um, outside of, of the project, of the core, and now they are separate apps built in React and Apollo, and they, they use GraphQL as you've seen in this short demo before. Uh, so this is like the new headless architecture, which also allows us to build external integrations around the platform. So this is a really great benefit of, of having API and especially GraphQL API here. So um, yeah, as I said, we are using Django for the backend. And we, when we started doing this transi transition, it was like two years ago or something like that. The only framework that was available was Graphene. And it's still the most popular framework for, for doing GraphQL in Python. So we are using that currently. Um, yeah, it's it's a code first uh, framework. So um, we are building GraphQL with Python classes, Python uh, functions, and the schema is generated uh, from that. And yeah, Graphene has support for popular Python web frameworks such as Django or Flask, uh, but you can also use it uh, standalone, let's say, uh, if, if that's your use case. So in, in this matter, this is a pretty flexible framework. So um, yeah, basically now I'd, I'd like to share a few lessons that uh, we've learned over those two years of using uh, Graphene at Sailor that you won't necessarily uh, learn from the docs or you wouldn't necessarily know after you know a few months of, of playing with the framework. Uh, yeah, so let's let's start with like maybe one of the most the, one of the biggest benefits of of Graphene, in my opinion. So. The first lesson is that um, Django plus, plus Graphene uh, lets you rapidly build APIs. So it means that this, this, this duo of Django and Graphene is really powerful if you want to prototype something very quickly 
or if you have large existing code base and you need to add GraphQL on top of that. So uh, let's see let's see why why it's like that in in Graphene. So uh, yeah, so so let's look at uh, how we define data in Django. So this is a simple uh, class that represents a user. Um, yeah, so so I think that it's it's pretty similar in in many other frameworks as well. Uh, we have a bunch of fields here. Uh, we are using Django ORM here to to use some uh, fields like emails, booleans, or date time. Uh, so so this this class would be later transformed to a data database table, right? So this is how most frameworks work. I, I, su I suppose that support ORM solution. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, models like this in our code base. And now, if you want to represent that um, in GraphQL, what would you do in Graphene? Uh, in this framework, uh, we are building simple classes like this one. So again, this is called user. Uh, this class and this is very simple because here in this meta class, we are saying that. Uh, we want to map fields from the user model. And by using this Django object type here, this class would magically uh, like use those fields from our model in our type. Uh, here we can specify which fields exactly we want to map. So uh, this reduces the risk of accidentally um, leaking some private fields, for example. So you need to make sure that you have only the fields that you want here. And basically, that's it. Uh, that would, out of the box, also generate all the field resolvers for us. So this is pretty pretty convenient. Uh, to bind this type to, to the schema, we need a query. So this is how we define queries in Graphene. Again, we are using object types. And here we define, this is listers. Uh, it's using the user type. and. Uh, we also have the resolve users function, which just uh, takes all data from from the database and returns that in this query. So this this few these few lines of Python code would result in in this schema. So that's that's how the code first approach works in Graphene. Uh, it's as I said, it's pretty convenient if you have existing API, sorry, existing code base, and you are adding GraphQL on top of that. So that was exactly what what uh, that's what was our case uh, for for using that. So to summarize that, um, mapping models to types in Graphene is effective uh, if you are building on top of existing code base. Um, you have uh, full control over the field resolvers, like they are mapped automatically, but you still can control what uh, like how they behave. If you want to add some permissions, for example, to a particular resolver, you can do that. Uh, easily. And what's also important here is that Graphene uses a uh, syntax like um, style of programming that is declarative, which is very similar to, to what you do in Django. So if your team is starting with Graph GraphQL and uses Graphene, then uh, it's it's really easy to dive in because you, you have the same programming style, the same patterns, uh, patterns used in, in both frameworks. So this is uh, really convenient to use. So that's uh, the first lesson about building types. Um, so now let's let's talk about mutations. So it seems that after building all of these mutations in our API, uh, it, it turns out that mutations are, are a bit more uh, tricky in Graphene, and this is not so obvious how to do that right when you start doing this. Um, so so let's see how you build mutations um, by default in Graphene. Um, yeah, because uh, I'm talking about Sailor, which is e-commerce platform, I have examples here, here like this one. So, for example, creating a product. Uh, so, what, what is going on here? We have a class called create product. Um, what is important in Graphene, every mutation is, is a class in, in, in this framework. So, here uh, we specify the input data in the class arguments. Um, here we specify the output of the mutation, so fields that would be returned as a result. In this case, we want to result uh, a new product. And here is the actual body of, of the mutation, so, so re the resolver. So here we say uh, what should happen when this mutation is called. And in this case, we are just getting data from our input. Uh, we are passing that to the uh, model instance and saving that in the database. So this is like very, very simple example of how a mutation would look like. But in real life, if you have a lot of operations like this and 
many business rules, this is usually more complex. Um, so first of all, um, there is no common pattern for input data validation. So for, like pretty often you want to have some, some business rules on, on the input that you are passing to the mutation. There are some constraints that you want, that you need to check before saving data. So there is no like easy way to do that in graphene or maybe let's say not like it's not obvious how to do that well uh, when you are starting. Uh, second uh, problem is that there is no, um, also no established pattern to return errors in graphene. So if we have some validation errors during the mutation execution, there is like, you, you as a developer have to figure out how to return those errors efficiently and you, you have to establish your own patterns. It's, it's not uh, given by, by graphene like. Uh, so, so this is kind of problematic at the beginning. And if you have a lot of mutations like this, um, and you add all of this business logic here, this would result in, in pretty large classes. So you would end up with a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, so we had to fix this somehow. And what we did uh, is we introduced a few abstractions. So these abstractions are not provided by Graphene uh, by default. Um, I mean, there are some abstractions that, for example, allows you to migrate from Django REST framework, which was like most popular framework for building REST APIs, but not if you are starting with pure Django app. So uh, here I want to show a few patterns that we've developed over the last two years. So let's start with unified errors handling in mutations. Uh, so we have this uh, little abstraction called base mutation and yeah, so here here are a few things going on. First of all, like uh, we've added our own uh, river for that mutation, which is called perform mutation. And as you can see here, we are calling this resolver inside the default resolver provided by Graphene. So, and and this this uh, perform mutation function is um, wrapped with try accept block, which basically looks for any validation error that could could happen during. Uh, execution of that mutation, and it does some job to format it nicely. So we don't have to care at, at this point what what it does, but like this is like one of the uh, responsibilities of of this uh, base mutation class. And here, as you can see, we have the errors field. So now uh, every mutation that extends this one, this base mutation pattern, would get this error fields uh, field as uh, one of the output fields. So if we use that constantly across our code base, uh, we have unified error handling because now every mutation has like very similar shape, um, which is what we want to have. Um, yeah. So for example, uh, if we take again this product create mutations as an example, uh, so you can see what we have here. We have some input data and below we have the errors field and for every error, we are uh, returning field, message, and code. So field tells us uh, which input field uh, resulted in, in an error. Message is actually meant for the developer. It's not to be displayed in the front end. And that's what we used to do, but uh, actually it, it doesn't work uh, in the long run because usually you have uh, your uh, translations in the front end code and not in the back end code. So you cannot show those messages in, in the front end simply. So for that, we have those error codes. So front end is uh, supposed to interpret those codes. And because these are enums, so for example, here is the response, the error response. So for example, we have codes like unique and, and some, some field name, uh, there is constraint that it must be unique. And now if you have a bunch of codes like this uh, and they are enums, so they are defined in the schema, front end, front -end uh, developer can handle that uh, easily and and display proper message in the front end. So having those base mutations allows us to do that uh, in every mutation that we have uh, in Sailor. So this is pretty cool and that's something that wasn't available in Graphene by default. Um, yeah, in our case, you've seen we have this dashboard application, which is basically large crude uh, app um, uh, because there is like, a lot of views where where you have just you know create new products, uh, create new uh, categories and stuff like this. It's just a lot of um, mutations that create and edit stuff. So 
Uh, and if you are building these mutations, you will quickly find out that they all follow the same pattern. So first you want to clean the input data um, because you have some validation rules. Uh, if if the if this data is is fine, then you want to create the a model instance from that data. Then you want to validate it validate it again, maybe. And lastly, you save that to the database. So every like we had a lot of mutations that fo followed exactly these four steps. So what can we do to make it easier to add these mutations? So we've developed another uh, abstraction called model mutation. Um, I'm not gonna show the source code of that because that would be uh, maybe too difficult to understand on such short uh, talk, but uh, this is just to give you idea how it looks uh, and how it works. So we only say that this mutation uses the product model and inside it knows how to, yeah, and it also takes the input object uh, as an argument. And inside it knows how to clean the object because we have the, um, validation rules defined at the model level in Django. And it, it does all the magic to generate this simple product create mutation. And it's very powerful because if you want to override particular step of, of for example, this, this flow that, you've, like, that we've seen on the slide before, there are just a bunch of methods that you can override and customize this flow. So we have types, we have mutations. So what about subscriptions, which are one of the most par powerful features of GraphQL. So it seems that if you are using Django, there is no native support for subscriptions, uh, unfortunately. Um, so the thing is that Django, as I said, is kind of classical MVC framework. And it was, it was also designed for this request response pattern. Uh, so it doesn't handle very well uh, asynchronous um, connections such as, uh, for example, um, Sorry, I, I lost the word, uh, not webhooks. Um, yeah, anyway, asynchronous uh, connections. So this is a synchronous framework basically. Uh, and for example, database access is synchronous and uh, there is no way to, to change that currently. So that's a huge blocker. Uh, so we cannot have subscriptions because of that uh, by default. But there is uh, a solution called Django channels, uh, which wraps entire Django application with additional layer that is able to process async requests. And this is still a pretty new thing. It's not so common to use, so not many people use that actually. And uh, yeah, so technically it would be possible to have subscriptions with Django. We haven't tried that because we yet haven't like use case for subscriptions in our application, but uh, that's how it looks like uh, currently in Django and Graphene. Um, yeah, so this is uh, database sync to async is kind of one of the tools you have to use with Django channels to have access to the database. Um, so so this is kind of possible, but it's also a third party library. It's something unusual. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of problematic in, in Django to support subscriptions currently. Um, so this brings us to the fourth lesson uh, that we've learned that if you are building fully fledged API in uh, Graphene and Django, you need a bunch of additional libraries. Um, so for example, uh, I said before that we support JSON web tokens um, for authentication, and that's true, but it's not provided by Graphene uh, by default. You need additional library for that. Uh, also to have permissions management based on JSON web tokens, you also need, like it's, it's the same library basically. Uh, which is fine because you can have this feature, but there is always uh, a risk with using third party libraries because you will never know if they will be maintained uh, because very often they are maintained by one person and or very small team. And yeah, it, it was a problem for us a few times already that we have to be dependent on some kind of library that it's not supported. Uh, the same is for Apollo Federation. Uh, it's also not uh, built into Graphene by default, but there is one library that can give give you this uh, this feature. Um, also, file upload. I know that file upload is kind of um, there is no agreement on how to do that. Well, in in GraphQL, there are a few patterns. Uh, for us, we wanted to have the basic file upload through a mutation, and 
it is possible to do that through multi-part requests in, in GraphQL. But again, to support that, you need another small uh, third-party library in, in your stack to, to have this feature. Uh, some features are actually not implemented at all. Uh, so, for example, query cost analysis, which is uh, a feature available in Apollo Server, for example, but in Graphene, it's it's not not available yet, and there are some open issues about that. Uh, and actually, I'm not sure what's what's the state of those issues. And that would be pretty useful in our case because you can use our API in the like headless solution. So we need to support query cost analysis at some point, and probably we will have to build support for that uh, ourselves. So. Uh, these are like the four lessons that that I've prepared. Uh, there would be much more stuff, but uh, I think these are the most important ones. So we've seen that there are some benefits uh, of graphene, but there are also some some downsides. So you may be wondering, uh, why do you guys use Python? Uh, because there are some some really well solutions on the market, such as uh, Apollo Server, which is probably one of the best uh, GraphQL servers out there. Um, so why don't you just migrate to Apollo Server since you've had to migrate your entire ar architecture? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we've been asking this question ourselves. And the answer is pretty simple for us. So the answer is that we are huge fans of Python. And basically, we decided to invest more time in this uh, language and GraphQL support in this language. And that's why we started using Graphene. And now we are actually developing our own framework. Um, yeah, and what I want to show here is also how the modern Python looks like. So, for example, um, this is Python 2.8. Uh, so, the, the new version, you know, uh, so you have async await uh, support in Python. So, you can do all of the asynchronous stuff right now. So, it, it wasn't available when, when Django was created, for example, but now it's, it's totally doable. So, we believe that Python is, is growing and actually, there are proofs that Python is growing because that's that's how it looks like compared to other languages. Um, because of data science, machine learning stuff, where Python is very popular, and also web development, Python is growing really strong uh, nowadays. So this makes us be believe that it's really worth uh, investing time in in developing developing solutions for for GraphQL in Python. So uh, last thing that I want to show you is uh, Ariadne. So this is uh, our own server for GraphQL that was inspired by Apollo server. Uh, it's a schema-first framework, and it has all the async features plus subscriptions. Um, it's, it's still um, quite early for that framework, like early days, because, for example, there is, uh, there is only very basic integrations with Django. Uh, so probably adding support for that is, is on our roadmap. But you can use that already to build, for example, federations, and we use that as well. And yeah, it's it's really cool um, framework, and we want to invest a lot of time in this. So um, we believe that it's really worth to do in in the Python uh, community. So that's that's all I have. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if if you if you want to know more about uh, about this. Um, th thanks, thanks so much, Marcin. It was an incredible, incredible talk. Uh, I really liked how did you how you describe a lot of like different features about GraphQL with Python, and and that's great because I do know that there are not so many people that they can touch different topics in the API architecture and a uh, like give that information to 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 us to all of us. So that's that's great. And thank thanks so much. So. Um, we do have a question in YouTube. Uh, so uh, three, uh, sorry for the names, like if I can, if I can personally correct it. Three, Grady, he is asking about, he has two questions. So one is uh, how we can handle file uploads via GraphQL in Django that I think that you have uh, yeah. discussed a bit about it. But then he also has another question, which is uh, that he's using the Django GraphQL GWT for authentication how he can use the same GWT for normal Django views authentication. I'm not sure if I, I totally, you can totally understand the question, but I, 
you can give a like a general overview about your experience with file uploads and GWT authentication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, let me. So there is basically one library uh, for uh, file upload in Graphene, which I need to check uh, out the name because I don't remember now. It's called probably, sorry, let me Google that really quickly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have it right now, but um, if you Google Graphene file upload, uh, there is one library. Uh, yeah, it's basically called Graphene file upload. And what it does, it, it defines uh, one mutation which you can use to upload files. It also uh, provides the uh, GraphQL type, which is called upload. And you can use that uh, to represent your files. It's a little bit complicated to test because um, you need to build this multi-part request somehow, and it's hard to do in uh, tools for like it's not possible to test in Playground, for example. Unfortunately, um, uh, I think you can use Insomnia or Postman to test that, uh, or uh, you can do that in in the con in the shell in console if you like. But uh, probably people use uh, Insomnia or something like that. And there you can test those uh, multi-part requests. Um, if can I share the link somewhere here? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, you might uh, feel free to share it in YouTube and also if you want in Twitter. But yeah, yeah I, also I, Zoom here. Yeah. So uh, because I'm not on YouTube, I'm only here on Zoom. Uh, yeah, I can send it. So so that's the library, and uh, there are also examples of how to actually build this. Um, Sorry, not in this repository, but there, okay. So I'll post another link, which is GraphQL multi-part request specification. And uh, this is a specification of how the multi-part request should should look like. Uh, yeah, so so that's the problem. Yeah, like uh, it's, it's not so easy to use, but it works for us. For example, uh, in our dashboard applications, we have upload of product images and that works perfectly well. And uh, the other approach of, of handling uh, file uploads is uploading directly to your storage, for example, uh, Amazon S S3. Um, so you, you are not doing this through your API, through your GraphQL API, but in some other way. That That's the other approach that I know, but we haven't used that uh, in our project yet. And there was also a second question about JSON Web Tokens, but... Um, I don't remember exactly what was it about, but I can quickly share just one more link um, for uh, for a library that you use. And this, again, if you use this, uh, it gives you access to few mutations, like token create, for example, uh, which creates a token based on credentials that we provided. And uh, there are also mutations to refresh the token. Um, so. Here's the link, um, and yeah, we, we use we use just just the, this this library for that. Awesome, yeah, that's that sounds great. So like really good a uh, resources. So I send all the links to YouTube. So you might link later with that person that he asked you the, the question, and I don't know. You can just have a quick chat about a Python graphing a GraphQL, which is great. So. Um, yeah, Marcin, thank, thanks so much for joining us from all of Rosa, Poland. And a, yeah, looking forward to, to, to knowing more about what you are doing in the community, like giving talks, like what you guys are doing with journal libraries in Salior. So that, that looks super promising. So I hope, hopefully we're going to know uh, soon more stuff about that. About that. So thanks, thanks so much thanks. for joining. Okay.